Uh, I think I'll change gears a little bit in terms of the presentations that we already heard. And in my presentation, I kind of will overview uh, some techniques in advanced crypto and what has been happening with the efficiency of the solutions, uh, somehow setting the stage uh, for the fact that once we have this improved efficiency, maybe this is the time when we start thinking about uh, the fact that these constructions will be used in practice and maybe this is also motivation for standardization in these areas. But of course, let me define what advanced crypto will mean for us, or at least for this talk. Advanced crypto will be uh, everything beyond uh, encryption and digital signatures, so uh, beyond cryptography that thinks about protection of data at rest and uh, communication. And in particular, in this talk, I will touch on three areas of advanced cryptography, which will include secure multi-party computation, uh, differential privacy, and zero knowledge. And these are the three of my choice because I think all three of them has been actually used in practical applications, including uh, not only academic papers, but companies looking at this and using them in practice. So then I have this uh, cre graph creation of my own that uh, for a while, uh, uh, research in cryptography has been going upwards and coming up with new functionalities, with new constructions and new capabilities while in practice, we've been stuck more or less using uh, signatures and encryption. Uh, and I would say that um, maybe in the last couple of years, uh, we have seen an upward slope where also in practice, we started implementing some of, some of the more uh, fancy um, functionality that comes from cryptography. And my hope is that in the future, these two slopes of uh, research in crypto and uh, use in practice will align. Uh, so, the motivation of uh, uh, this talk uh, for me came when I uh, listened to the talk of Shai Halevi at CCS uh, last year, where he made uh, the claim that advanced crypto is needed fast enough to be useful and not generally usable yet. So, uh, and when we talk about advanced cryptography, there are many things that come uh, into the mix. Uh, in particular, we have to be thinking about trade-offs between efficiency and utility. We have to think about the specific setup of parties that we are looking at. What are the assumptions about communication and comput computational channels, the available uh, resources at each party, uh, and also try to put our finger on where the trade-off between efficiency and utility makes sense for our application. And some of the uh, insights that I have in this talk also came from a workshop that we organized with NeurIPS last year on privacy preserving machine learning. And we have another one of this with CCS this year. Uh, so the need for advanced crypto, I don't think uh, uh, there is much to pitch to this audience, but basically our challenge here is that we have uh, data, which is arguably the most valuable resource nowadays. And we want to use it, we want to analyze it. That's how uh, many uh, things work in practice. Uh, and then there are many challenges related to the privacy of this data and uh, these advanced crypto techniques bring the promise that we can uh, obtain utility from this private data without sacrificing privacy. So hence we are uh, kind of striving for this functionality. And now since this is a standardization workshop, uh, while I'm describing this, uh, uh, solutions and their uh, efficiency, uh, kind of the main message is that many of these technologies are ready to start to be used in practice and standardization will definitely help adoption because companies like to have standards that they follow when they use some of these advanced techniques. Uh, these advanced cryptography uh, notions have much more complexity notions, so uh, it's interesting and, uh, and challenging how to convey uh, those properties in a standard so that people who are not necessarily experts might be able to use them. Uh, also, there is a plethora of constructions and techniques for each of these primitives uh, that give slightly different guarantees. So when we standardize, we have to think what exactly do we standardize of this multitude of techniques. And also these techniques have a wide range of applications uh, uh, and oftentimes in the, to solve this real application problems, we need to use more than one of these tools. Uh, so a, a question for standardization is whether standardization should be kind of driven or aware 
of the applications that we try to solve and that we are trying to solve first with these techniques. So with this, I will continue with my overview of kind of recent work. And I need to uh, do the disclaimer that uh, I might have missed your work. This wasn't on purpose, but this is just kind of an overview that gives you a flavor of what has been happening with efficiency of these techniques. And I will start with uh, secure computation, or privacy preserving computation, where I will distinguish kind of two scenarios. The first scenario is the one where we have few parties that are participating in the computation, and they have more or less equal uh, computational resources and communication available among them, and they're available for the whole execution of the protocol. The second uh, scenario, which I will refer to as federated learning, is more of a setting where we have one central party that has a lot of computational resources and then uh, many uh, weak parties that uh, interact with this main uh, computational uh, server. Uh, these parties cannot talk among each other. They can only talk to the server. Uh, and then they are also very unreliable. So uh, some of these parties may disappear during the execution of the protocol. So we would like to tolerate dropouts in this setting. So let's look what do we know in the uh, first setting. Um, and uh, I will start with a look of, at fully homomorphic encryption. We already heard uh, about initiatives in this area. Of course, fully homomorphic encryption gives us the capability to uh, take some data, encrypt it, give it to another party, and then ask this party to compute any function we want on the uh, encrypted data. So this... Uh, uh, <coughs> Construction has been known from 2009, and what do we know now in terms of efficiency is that, uh, of course, the most expensive uh, operation in, uh, under FHE is multiplication, and currently what we can do is we can compute a circuit of depth 20, so 20 consecutive, consecutive multiplication in about 62 milliseconds. Also, if we want to work, look at specific application, which comes from this i dash competition that was com uh, looking at logistic regression or training on using logistic regression with 1,500 patient records and 18 features, uh, uh, one iteration of gradient descent was taking between 0 0.4 and 3.2 hours in this setting using uh, FHE. So this is kind of where FHE, some of the recent FHE efficiency stands for. Uh, another uh, um, kind of application that has been looked uh, a lot in practice is the question of private set intersection. Two parties have two sets and they want to find the intersection of their two inputs without revealing anything more about the data. Uh, this, there have been many, many works that look at this uh, question. So. What do we know now uh, in the setting of semi-honest and uh, malicious security is that uh, in the setting of semi-honest, if we want to intersect uh, um, sets of sizes two to the uh, 20, we can do this uh, in just a couple of seconds. And if we want to do this uh, with malicious security, we have to do a couple of hours. And this, uh, uh, this functionality or extension of this inter, uh, functionality, which is private intersection sum, has been used also uh, by Google for in the setting of some aggregate add attribution. Uh, another functionality that has been of uh, uh, great interest for people is private information retrieval, where we have one database owner and we have uh, a party that wants to submit queries. And the goal is to respond to these queries without, without the database owner learning anything about this query. Uh, this type of constructions of private information retrieval usually rely on homomorphic encryption in either additive or fully homomorphic encryption. So one of the, mo the most recent work in this uh, uh, setting allows you to uh, compute uh, private information retrieval query again on a database of size 2 to the 22 in about 12 seconds. So this is, uh, in many settings, maybe one other caveat is that here, the sizes of the items in the database are 288 bytes. So efficiency of here also depends on the size of the entries. So these were kind of two, two or three examples of uh, functionalities that have been in interest and have been uh, used in practice. Uh, but of course, we know that we can do general two-party computation. Uh, where uh, two parties with inputs X and Y can evaluate any function that depends on their joint inputs. 
So this has been uh, a problem of research of a lot of uh, works in the last 10 years. So, and I'm talking only about implementations, like MPC has been studied for over 30 years. But these are two graphs that kind of give the slope of improvement in implementations for these two techniques in the setting of uh, malicious security and semi-honest security. Uh, and we are looking at the question of securely evaluating AES. So one party has the key, the other party has the input, they want to evaluate uh, AES. So initially, the semi-honest solutions 10 years ago were taking hours to evaluate this. Uh, currently, we can do the secure evaluation in one, under one uh, millisecond. Uh, in the malicious setting, we were going from months 10 years ago, and today we can do this uh, again in about 10 milliseconds. So kind of the message here is that we have seen this tremendous improvement in uh, efficiency of two-party computation, and this kind of brings us, brings MPC in the realm of uh, cryptographic techniques that uh, could be usable in practical applications, and we should think about how uh, we can uh, make this more usable using standards. Of course, one of the most enticing application of MPC is uh, machine learning. Uh, where kind of the, uh, my conclusion, at least for, from the techniques that exist so far, is that out of the box use of MPC techniques is not the most efficient, it's, it's not the way to go if you want to use MPC for machine learning. Uh, kind of, if you want to combine MPC and machine learning, you have to do effort in both directions, in the sense that you have to look at your ML algorithms and you have to make them MPC friendly. Right, fixed point computation is what's efficient in MPC. Usually ML algorithms all rely on floating point uh, computation, so changing the algorithms to be friendly for fixed point evaluations is a good thing to do. Uh, Nonlinearity is expensive in MPC. Try to avoid uh, uh, do approximations that avoid nonlinearity. Also, we have seen a lot of work trying to adapt MPC to the needs for, of machine learning computation. Uh, for example, taking advantage of the fact that we need only approximate uh, 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 final results in many ML applications. So we, we have seen MPC approaches that leverage this approximate correctness, as well as FHE constructions that do the same. Also, the machine learning territory is a territory where we really can play with the trade-offs between efficiency and accuracy. Uh, many of these regression-based algorithms that have many iterations allow you to do this kind of in a nice, seamless way. And one final point is that uh, a lot of the machine learning uh, wants to distinguish computation on sparse data. There are standards such as the sparse BLAST that are focused on how to optimize algorithms when you're dealing with sparse data. So you could think of this also as something you want to take advantage in the context of MPC. So let me uh, just give you a, a few examples of uh, what has been done in MPC for machine learning. So one example is computing distributed linear regression. In this particular work, we were looking at a vertically partitioned database, uh, and we were experimenting with uh, uh, model iterative uh, solutions based on uh, fixed point gradient descent. Uh, so kind of one uh, Bottom line is that if you want to solve systems of linear equations uh, of dimension uh, 500 and you are happy with the approximate solution where CGD with only 20 iteration al already gives you something very meaningful, you could do this in about uh, 100, a couple of hundred seconds. If we want to talk about solving the linear regression, uh, if we have 500 records, uh, 500,000 records, uh, with attributes, with 500 attributes, you can do uh, this in about uh, two hours. Of course, uh, when we talk about machine learning, neural network uh, computation is one of the favorite applications. So here we can distinguish between neural net inference, where one party has the model and the other one has the input, and you want to do the classification in an MPC manner. And the other one is how to do the training in secure computation, where the inputs are partitioned between two parties. So here I'll list some of the most recent uh, works and what they achieve. Uh, this is a work that looks at uh, convolutional neural networks, and this is the question of uh, uh, private prediction. Uh, and uh, these uh, experiments that they uh, 
presented. So the, this solution combines MPC with FHE in an interesting uh, and non-trivial manner. Uh, these are some uh, evaluations using the MNIST dataset, which is classifying uh, digits, handwritten digits. And you can see that with different topologies for these uh, convolution neural networks, the runtime goes from uh, uh, a couple of uh, milliseconds to uh, about one second. And the main different factor, distinguishing factor, is really the communication, which changes. Uh, Uh, of course, this uh, MNIST uh, dataset is considered like a toy example uh, for real machine learning uh, applications. CFAR takes a little bit further, so the evaluation with CFAR uh, shows you that uh, quickly your time goes up, but still it's uh, about 13 seconds, which is could be acceptable in many settings. Uh, uh, and communication again goes up once once the neural net. Uh, topology starts to be more complicated, communication is the first thing that uh, seems to go up. Uh, a more recent work uh, looks at the same question, but they are trying to uh, look at binarized neural networks uh, and uh, there are special types of neural networks where that use only binary values and then they uh, show you kind of new results. Uh, one thing is that when you are doing um, this type of machine learning uh, applications, you really need to look at the accuracy that you're getting out of your secure computation because without accuracy, this is usually uh, meaningless. Uh, so in this work, they uh, managed to get very uh, good accuracy for, uh, again, the MNIST data set, and uh, they are improving on the runtime from the previous work. Now the runtime is uh, approximately 0 0.1 uh, to 2 seconds, and communication Again, is the main distinguishing factor when you are employing different uh, topologies that allow you to go up in accuracy. Uh, maybe the most recent work that I'm aware of uh, in this setting is this uh, work of Quotient, two-party neural network training and prediction. Uh, this work looks at turnerized neural networks and in a nice way to leverage oblivious transfer for many of the computations in this, in this context. Uh, so here they also look at uh, several real data sets that include um, smartphone accelerometer meter and gyroscope sensor data, uh, different uh, data sets for uh, predicting thyroid and cancer uh, diseases, as well as uh, some info information for German credit card uh, companies that tries to classify the transactions as uh, bad or good from different uh, clients. So here are their results. Maybe they are, uh, this is a little slow, small, but uh, they show that essentially if you want to run a neural net training, you will need several days if you are happy with uh, smaller accuracy. And if you really want to go close to the accuracy that's coming from the floating point, uh, this will take you weeks, if not months. But one kind of uh, message here is that sometimes even in practice, uh, in the clear neural net uh, training takes uh, could take weeks for large data sets. So these numbers are not necessarily impossible in practice in, in view of what's happening with uh, uh, training in, uh, in the clear. Uh, the prediction, they also show you how to do prediction that takes uh, basically a few, uh, usually a few seconds for smaller data sets uh, and up, up to 40, 60 seconds for some of the, the larger data. Um, since I'm running uh, low on time, I will just quickly say that uh, we have also this work that looks at the sparsity and what, what can you do with MPC if your sparsity, the level of sparsity of your data is public and you want to optimize on this. And the main message is that uh, you could get a lot of improvement. Uh, many of these data sets are very sparse. You could have uh, non-zero uh, entries at the level of uh, uh, 1, 2, 3 percent, up to 10 percent, and you could significantly optimize your MPC for this set. Uh, so now let's, let's go to the other uh, setting for MPC, which was this federated learning, which I mentioned, where we have many parties uh, interacting with one powerful uh, server. Uh, so this is a setting that's 
really of interest to uh, many of the companies. So uh, Google has been having this secure aggregation protocol that allows you to accumulate gradient descents uh, coming from uh, smartphones uh, in a manner that you review only the aggregate of uh, these uh, gradient updates. Uh, so the numbers that they have uh, demonstrated uh, show you that uh, if you want to do vectors of size uh, 100K uh, and you have about uh, 500 clients, you can do this uh, in about 1,200 minutes. Uh, and you can see that this scales more or less linearly with the number of clients. And then on the other hand, uh, if you want to uh, fix the number of clients to about 500 and then you are increasing the uh, dimension of the vector that you're aggregating, again, you have this linear scaling for the time and you can, you can achieve this for the largest parameters, about uh, 500 parameters. So uh, this, is, this is kind of um, ballpark uh, runtime in terms of uh, minutes to hours, which if you are running this uh, uh, fairly, if you don't demand real time uh, response, but you're running this from time to time, is still within the realm of uh, usable efficiency. Uh, another work that kind of looks at the same, uh, the same question, but different architecture, and that it assumes that you could split your server in two or more parties that are non colluding. Uh, then you could apply new different techniques to do this. Uh, so this uh, work of uh, which has been also implemented uh, in a deployment of Firefox uh, looks at this model and it shows you how to do uh, the dimensional least square regression and basically this table tells you how much o overhead or slowdown uh, the MPC introduces compared to the uh, computation in plain text and uh, you can see that uh, de depending on your regression they mentioned this overhead goes from uh, five times to about 12 times uh, compared with the computation. In so now I want to turn to the uh, next primitive that I mentioned uh, in the beginning, which is uh, differential privacy. Uh, and now differential privacy uh, asks a different uh, question. Uh, so far we were talking about having multiple uh, parties and computing on their inputs in a way that doesn't review anything more than the output of the parties. Now equally important uh, problem is uh, asking the question how much actually the output of this compute. And differential privacy is the technique that looks at this question and tries to give a meaningful measure of privacy for the evaluation. Uh, especially when we are in a setting of computing over the inputs of many parties or databases of uh, people, users, etc. So for differential privacy, uh, we have two main uh, settings. One of them is called the central model, which assumes that we have a trusted aggregator where everybody, uh, all the clients send their inputs and this trusted aggregator computes answers to aggregate functionalities and then this is made public. The answers of these aggregate functionalities are made uh, public, but we are not protecting against the privacy of the individual inputs against this trusted aggregator. The other model in differential privacy, which is called the local model, uh, wants to remove the trust in this aggregator and requires uh, a mechanism that uh, each party or each participant kind of adds noise to their data and the untrusted aggregator can compute this aggregate uh, computation on based on the based on the inputs that they 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 receive, but without having to put trust in this aggregator. So you want to guarantee privacy of the individual inputs, even with respect to this aggregator. And the notion of differential privacy requires that if you are doing this computation on uh, databases that differ by a single uh, record, the outputs of this computation are uh, close not be distinguished. So there has been a lot of work in the central model. We know to do how, we know how to do many, uh, we have general mechanisms uh, that achieve uh, differential privacy in the central model. We have also many specialized methods for uh, different uh, functionalities of interest, such as empirical risk minimization, stochastic gradient descent, Bayesian inference, and many others. 
One could argue that really the second model, the local model, is much more relevant in many of the practical applications. And this is what uh, companies like Google and Apple uh, have been looking at, especially when you are looking at the setting of collecting private statistics from, uh, from your users. Of course, this second model is the one that's much more challenging for coming up with good solutions. So uh, one example that has been studied in the, uh, in the second model of local differential privacy is the question of uh, heavy hitters or de detecting if, if each of your uh, clients is submitting, for example, different words or different uh, values, how do you uh, detect the ones that occur uh, most often? So. Uh, one of the most recent works in this area uh, gives you a way that essentially incurs error square root of n, where n is the number of, in, of uh, participants, and this is kind of also the lower bound in this uh, uh, local model. And uh, still, this, um, this new construction guarantees that you could get very, very good, fairly good accuracy between the uh, true counts and the predicted counts uh, when, when you're looking at the most... Uh, uh, most often occurring element or the rank 10 or, or the, the rank 100. Uh, also what this work achieves is that it has a much better uh, hill, so it gives you much better accuracy even when you go down to the uh, most often counts. Another, uh, another kind of uh, uh, functionality that you want to compute in this setting is frequency estimation. And there, the work of Rapport uh, from Google had kind of was the first solution that was implemented, and people have been looking and comparing against it. So uh, this work from Usenix in 2017 introduces new hashing mechanisms that allow you to scale much more gracefully with the increase of epsilon, which means essentially that once you start allowing more leakage in privacy, you suddenly get much more utility. Because one of the biggest challenges in this setting is to get acceptable utilities. Local differential privacy usually uh, gives you very good privacy, but the challenges are related with the utility that uh, you're getting in this model. So this work uh, shows you how to uh, do these trade-offs much more gracefully and also uh, allows to get much higher uh, level of true positives. So true positives is in a setting where you want to detect the counts that are above a certain threshold uh, correctly, and this work shows you how to, to get much more uh, true positives. So, and there has been some direction of very interesting works that are called amplification uh, of differential privacy. So there is a general way to compose differential privacy with secure computation, which essentially says that you can take uh, a central uh, model uh, of differential privacy and turn it into a local model by using uh, secure computation to implement the aggregator. However, in practice, this often incurs quite inefficient solutions. So what people have been looking is this uh, intermediate model, which is called the shuffle model, uh, which assumes that your aggregator is untrusted, but there is an assumption that there is a shuffle, so all the inputs that are coming from the clients are first shuffled before sent to the uh, untrusted aggregator. So how you implement the shuffle is a separate question, but just to point out something is that in this model now, you suddenly start to rely on other, uh, other users uh, honestly contributing their inputs, because if they don't uh, do that, then your privacy will be compromised. So this model kind of introduces further assumptions for the other users, but allow you to get much better trade-offs between privacy and utility. Essentially, what we know is that while the local model uh, occurs square root of n error uh, in terms of the number of parties now, this shuffle model allows you to get only to logarithmic error. And in particular, this uh, uh, paradigm has been implemented using SGX for the shuffle, and it has been demonstrated that you could uh, do computation uh, up to 10 million in about uh, two hours. Uh, and also another more recent work, which will be presented here, shows how to formalize further the shuffle model and get to much better bounds, also extends the result for larger values of epsilon, uh, and uh, kind of 
further gives you insight into this new model. Uh, also, uh, people have been studying a way to combine this notion of secure aggregation with the differential privacy in a way that uh, will allow you to distribute in a better way the, the, the addition of noise in the setting of uh, uh, differential privacy. And one of the challenges uh, there is that you would like to minimize the communi communication that's going from the small devices up to the server. So uh, some of these works have been studying how to use different type of noises uh, for differential privacy, for example, binomial noise that uh, still scales and, or converges to uh, Gaussian noise when we have many clients. And essentially, they have been studying how we, for different values of epsilon, which is the level of privacy, you could minimize uh, your communication. Uh, so that's, that's this type of solutions also rely on techniques that are called quantization, uh, which essentially uh, allow you or help you to round when you are using uh, real numbers. And this is the main point where this quantization doesn't usually uh, interact very nicely with Gaussian noise, but it interacts and composes quite uh, nicely with the binomial. So, so this work has been uh, looking at uh, these questions and exploring how far we can reduce the communication, the federated learning pattern. So this brings me to the last uh, type of uh, functionality I wanted to discuss, which is uh, zero knowledge proofs. And we already heard a lot about uh, zero knowledge that we would like to uh, have a way, for example, to prove that an encryption of some value is within some range and to produce a proof for, for this uh, uh, statement. Of course, we can uh, generalize this to any statement. And we've had many solutions that are uh, achieving this functionality. Uh, why do we care about zero knowledge proofs? I think that's uh, unnecessary to justify here. Of course, blockchain applications have been tagged as one uh, of the potential uses. Uh, there are many more. Uh, when you talk about machine learning, maybe you care about proving that your machine learning computation was done correctly as well. So you would like to produce a, a zero knowledge proof for your inference or for your training. Of course, when we talk about zero knowledge uh, protocols, uh, there are many measures that you need to consider. This is prover efficiency, verifier efficiency, succinctness, uh, how long is your proof, uh, whether you need an interaction or uh, non-interaction for your uh, construction, and uh, of course, whether you need a trusted setup. Where a trusted setup uh, essentially says that you need to compute some uh, TRS or some common reference string that depends on secret information. And if this secret information is revealed, then all uh, soundness guarantees of your uh, protocol disappear. Uh, so oftentimes, as Ran mentioned in his uh, protocol, SNARKs, or the succinct non-interactive arguments of knowledge, are of primary interest. Uh, and then in other, other solutions are uh, not so much, but of course, the their settings in which they have applications as well. Uh, so for SNARKs, uh, most of our understanding is that we require trusted setup. Uh, there are some works that are looking also at hybrid solutions that offer uh, functionality that could uh, function either as SNARK or have a, a way to back to backfall to a regular uh, constructions that don't require trusted setup. So here, I will kind of give you what we know in terms of efficiency of SNARKs first. Uh, so most of the implementations of uh, DK SNARKs rely on uh, this uh, work on quadratic arithmetic program uh, that are implemented and instantiated in different ways. And uh, this work from uh, USENIX last year looks at the way to distribute the prover uh, in a uh, SNARK construction. So, uh, they are trying to parallelize the work of the, the prover and see how uh, they can optimize uh, the prover uh, work. So here, what they managed to achieve is that the overhead for the prover for each gate of computation is about 10 microseconds. And the verifier time in these uh, zero-knowledge snarks 
usually the verifier is very efficient. That's one of the appeal of this construction. So here the verification time is uh, two milliseconds plus uh, uh, 0 0.5 microseconds per uh, input for the uh, zero knowledge statement. If we want to look at some of the application that they consider, they can do ma matrix multiplication. The prover time for matrix multiplication, 700 by 700 is 74 seconds. Uh, or if you want to do linear regression, this was one of the examples I was telling you in the context of machine learning. If you want to do a linear regression on 20,000 points uh, in dimension 500, they can generate a proof that the training was done correctly in 95 seconds. So still in the uh, setting of zero knowledge with trusted setup, there is another work that really aims at improving the prover time. So uh, most of the zero knowledge uh, SNARK constructions kind of re require the prover to be uh, quasi-linear in the size of the circuit that you are evaluating. This work really brings the prover down to be linear in the size of the circuit that you are computing, and they are trading it off uh, with the size of the proof. So now here the proof becomes logarithmic of the circuit and linear in the depth of the circuit. Uh, this work is uh, based on the GKR technique and they essentially show you how uh, you can improve on some of the SNARK uh, where the main improvement you should be looking for it in the proof. They, uh, they manage to get a little bit better than some of the implementation SNARKs in terms of uh, prover time. Uh, and then we have the comparisons with uh, verification and proof size where still the, uh, the SNARK constructions which were meant, these were their properties, achieve better efficiency in terms of verification. And proof. They also looked at some examples for image scaling where you are uh, changing from high to low resolution by scaling your, your image. And they show that uh, you can do this for images of size uh, 10 to the 6 pixels uh, about the, the prover time is uh, about 100 seconds, uh, then verification uh, is uh, about 10, 20 seconds, and the proof size uh, is also uh, very small. So if we want to move outside the realm of uh, trusted setup, so this trusted setup is a requirement that often kind of uh, brings up issues when you have practical uh, implementations, like in particular, who is going to generate this trusted setup for you. So if you want to look at zero knowledge without trusted setup, there has been a plethora of work. Uh, in this setting, the proof size starts to vary from logarithmic uh, to linear in the circuit size. The verifier work also varies uh, from logarithmic to linear. Uh, the prover's work is... Uh, um, quasi-linear, oftentimes polynomial in the size of the circuit. Uh, so we have different constructions that are based on discrete log, on MPC, on this IOP model. Uh, and we can see oftentimes the canonical example that people are evaluating with is computing, computation of a Merkle tree. Uh, and most of the uh, examples go to about 2 to the 8 uh, leaves in the Merkle tree. And you can see that uh, prover time in setting again takes about 100 seconds depending on the different implementations. Uh, the verification time, uh, the verification time again varies a lot across different uh, implementations, but some of them give you close to a couple of seconds and some of them really scale with the, uh, with the size of the prover. So that's, but the message, the mo the message here is that we can handle these uh, Merkle tree proofs for these sizes of Merkle trees with times that are fairly uh, usable in many. And one last uh, work that I wanted to talk about is this work on ZK Starks uh, that uh, look at a different uh, uh, paradigm of computation, which is interactive uh, Oracle proof. Uh, and they uh, also claim. Uh, kind of new uh, trade-offs compared to uh, the existing uh, ZK Stark works, as well as some of the works that uh, don't rely, rely on trusted setup. ZK Starks don't rely on trusted setup. 
Um, but maybe most uh, interesting is to look at one of their application, which is DNA profile matching. Essentially, you are trying, you have a database of uh, DNA profiles, which goes to different sizes. Like they go to, their actual experiments go to up to two to the 32 uh, database size of DNA profiles. And then what you want to compute a, a proof for is that uh, you have a DNA profile that is not included in this database. So uh, for this type of computation, uh, depending on the size of your database, you see the, the prover uh, for databases of the 30 works in several hours, uh, which maybe is user, usable in, in settings where you want to prove once that you are not present. In. And then verification time is quite efficient. Uh, you can do this in uh, less than a few minutes. Uh, again, the trade-off goes into the size of the, of the proof, which scales kind of linear. So with this, I think I'm, I'm out of time, so I will wrap it up that we have lots of advanced crypto techniques that have achieved efficiency that is very close to what we can start using, using in practice. Using these uh, techniques often requires to have an expert who knows how to use this technique. So this kind of brings a challenge when we want to standardize how to, to go around this issue that we need this expert for using these techniques and what is the best way to standardize and offer some insights that maybe people who are not experts could use as well. So there have been these standardization efforts that have been discussed, and there are also many sources uh, for, for, for MPC, for zero knowledge, and for differential privacy. And then I'll conclude with uh, Shaikha Levy's uh, uh, words that it's time to put these tools to use. Thank you. I have the question to you. So, as far as I know, there are no non interactive zero knowledge protocols in the plane model without setup. That's the gold right core. So, there are no non interactive zero knowledge protocols without trusted setup. They don't exist, right? So, so, no, okay, so what I mean is that one should say that all these protocols are in the random Oracle model, right? They are non-interactive, and they claim to be zero knowledge, so there are, have to be a, some assumption on the random Oracle, right? So it's not just you, but I think there are a bunch of papers here in the titles in the, this workshop that say non-interactive zero knowledge without trusted setup, which is something that doesn't exist. It doesn't matter. There is a proof that without any trusted setup, no interactive zero knowledge does not exist. It's in all, you know, it's the basic thing. Distribute it way the unstructured string versus the uh, versus the yeah. structured one. Right. So, so maybe the, the term unstructured, untrusted setup without untrusted setup is is kind of like misleading. It, it is yeah. a setup. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a fair yeah. point. Yeah. So, is, so in yeah, many of the settings where this no, right? no trusted setup has been yeah. used, it's essentially assuming this unstructured uh, um, reference string. A or reference or string. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So yeah, yeah, but for for those, yeah, th 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 this is the classification that was used in my slides as yeah. well. Yeah. Okay. 